I'm going to start with one simple question. It's going to, and we're going to go through numbers. How many orchids do you have? One to 20? Raise your hands. Okay. As I go up in numbers, drop your hands, but raise them up. All right. One to 20. 20 to 40. Keep them up. If you're up at 40, keep them up. Okay, 40 to 80. One, two, three, four. 80 to 100. <laughs> They're both Orchid Society members. Okay, all right. 100 to 120. 180. Wow, girl, you've really gone up. You've got to catch up. I've got 600 at home. I'm running out of room. Actually, I'm out of room. All right, with that in mind, my job is to educate you and get you where you have 200 orchids. Every one of you, I hope, walks out of here with an orchid today. Um, Orchids are really interesting. Um, most people know that they grow on every continent, but what? Antarctica. It's the only continent in this, on this planet that does not grow orchids. Okay? Obviously they can't because it's frozen solid. Um, there is an orchid for every, every climate, every amount of sun, um, to cold weather, to snow. I've seen orchids with snow on them. Um, so you can grow an orchid just about anywhere. It doesn't matter if you've got shade, bright indirect shade, you've got partial sun, or you've got full sun. There is an orchid that you can grow wherever you're at, okay? Who knows the difference? And you Orchid Society members, keep your mouth shut because I know you know the answers to some of these questions. Um, who knows what epiphytic is? All right, epiphytic means that they um, grow attached to things. All right, who knows what parasitic means? Parasitic means that it actually is attached to something and it is taking nutrients from that item. Um, it's like a tick with a dog. A tick, you know, climbs onto a dog and a tick is sucking the blood. Orchids are not parasitic. They are epiphytic. All they are using the items for is to hold on to to survive. Um, orchids typically, um, most orchids are typically epiphytic. There are some ground species that actually do grow in the soil. Most of them are either mounted on bark or on a tree or on rocks. We have seen at the Orchid Society, we've had a couple of speakers come in that have done presentations in South America where we've seen orchids growing on bare rock faces where there are indents, where all the detritus and sand and dust and stuff settles down in that little hole and the orchid will grow in that section um, out in full sunlight. Okay, now, how many of you grow Phalaenopsis? How many of you know what a Phalaenopsis is? Phalaenopsis is the moth orchid. That's what these guys are, okay? These are probably the most common throwaway plant now that you will buy. It has replaced the poinsettia as the number one selling potted plant in the world. Not just the country, but the world. Um, they are growing so many of them and mass producing them. It used to be that you would have a name tag with each one of them. Now they're just growing them for you to put on your coffee table or kitchen table. Enjoy them while they're going. And then once they're done, a lot of people will either throw them away, give them away, or they'll try to rebloom them. My goal with you guys is to get you to keep them, regrow them, and then bloom them out again. 
So these are not throwaways, unless you get one of those blue dyed ones at Home Depot. They're throwaways. Um, that blue dyed orchid is going to be white next year. There's debate on that whether or not it does or not. We're not sure whether or not that dye chokes up the veining or arteries in the plant. Yeah. Um, so we're not 100% positive that those plants will live long term. Mm -hmm. They may live for a couple of years, but you know nobody's ever done a study on it at this point. Um, any of the serious orchid growers, um, treat them like the plague. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you have to remember that they're a novelty, like the dyed carnations in high school. It's a novelty. So if you like the colors, go ahead, buy it. It's not gonna be that color next year. It might be a little tinge to that color, but it's not gonna be that color next year. What they do is they actually put a hole in the flower spike while the flowers are all in bud. As the flowers open up, there's a little ampule that they clamp onto that hole and it's clamped onto the flower spike. And as the flowers start to open up, it draws that dye into it and it dyes the flowers. How many of you water with ice cubes? Raise your hands nice and high. Don't do that. If I catch you using ice cubes, I'm gonna use ice cubes on you. All right, let's, let's talk about that little trick about ice cubes. What temperature does ice melt at? 32 degrees. Do you like 32 degrees? I don't. These are tropical plants. They don't like cold water like that. And when you're putting it on the root system, you're going to really make it unhappy. The water with ice was done as a gimmick um, by a company up north somewhere. Please don't do that. Um, it just sets them back. This orchid does not like temperatures below 50 degrees. You're now putting 32 degree water on it. It doesn't make any sense. If you're gonna water these, put them in the kitchen sink, fill up the pot with water, let it sit there for five minutes, then go back through, put water in it, fill it up again, and let it rest, okay? That's the way you water these guys inside the house. You do not sit there and take them outside and spray the whole thing, especially if they're white flowers. What happens with that is you get little black dots on the flowers. How many of you have seen white phalaenopsis with little black pencil dots on them? That's a fungus. Um, and that's from getting the flowers wet when you water them. Um, so, you know, I'm gonna cover that and that's, I'm gonna tell you how to water these guys first off and, and easily. They're very easy to grow. They don't take a lot of light requirements. They will live indoors and do just fine. Indoors in air conditioning, put it in the kitchen sink once a week, fill it up with water, Check the moss with your finger to make sure it's, it's wet. I'm gonna pass this around. I watered everybody else last night. I held back on a couple and you're gonna feel the weight and I'm gonna pass two of them around and you can weigh them out and feel the difference. If it's wet, it's gonna be heavier. If it's dry, it's gonna be a lot lighter. This one was watered last night. This one was not. You can feel the weight difference, okay? And I'll let you guys pass those around there's a big difference. You can check your orchids um, by how much water you've got inside the pot, by how much it weighs. Water weighs what, eight, 7.6 or 7.8, I think, per gallon of water. Um, so that's an easy way to test them. The other way is you can take a A number two pencil, freshly sharpen it, and you can actually insert it down in the pot. If it comes back out clean and dry, it's time to water it. If it's coming back out with stuff on it and it's a little damp, wait a couple of days. What's the number one killer of orchids? 
No, you're right, it's water. So, people, who said that? You're right. You're actually right, it's people. <laughs> don't be, you know, guys with orchids, um, don't be afraid um, to try new things. There's all kinds of neat stuff out there. You just have to kind of look for them, um, but they're out there. I'm always trying new species and different types um, just to see if I can grow it. I can't tell you how many I've killed. Um, while working with John Odom down in Fort Pierce, I've seen John walk out to an orchid bench and pick up a plant in a pot, a six inch pot, bring it to the potting area, throw it in the trash and go, well, that was $10,000. So, you know, if, if we, you know, if we can kill that stuff, so can you. <laughs> um, it happens, you know, especially to a serious collector like John Odom. So my intention is to get you guys interested and get your hobby going a little bit. What I want to talk to you guys today is the different varieties, types of orchids that we have um, here at the nursery now. We brought in some new stuff this week. I got a couple of fresh shipments in. Um, how many of you have seen what, what we in the Orchid Society call bag babies? Everybody's seen these bag babies at all the other stores, the big box stores. Okay, that head grower over at Sarasota is the man that grows these. Um, this plant typically at a show is gonna cost you anywhere between $25 and $30. These bag babies are $18.99. $18 you know, typically some of this stuff is $25 to $30 at a show. These things are great value. Now, my job is to bring them in and see how I can do with you guys to sell them. Um, but the nice thing about these, you go into the big box stores, you look at all the orchids, there's no name tags on them. Every one of these plants has its name. You can take that name on your cell phone and Google it. A picture of that flower will come up. Um, there are some great finds in this stuff. Um, one of, my, one of our, our people here yesterday raided the boxes yesterday and took home a uh, Susan Fender's cinnamon stick. That orchid down at Odom sells for 50 bucks in a six inch pot. She paid $18.99 for it. So, I mean, if you know what you're looking for in these bag babies, you can find some really neat stuff. And there's everything from Cattleyas to Dendrobiums. Um, there are, I haven't brought in any of the Vandas yet. I'm sticking mainly to the Cattleya type, um, but there's all kinds of different varieties um, you know, the star-shaped ones, and you can tell I watered them yesterday, she's still dripping, um, and that's the problem in the big box stores, nobody takes care of them, they sit on the rack and they dehydrate. Um, the encyclias, everybody knows why this area is called Orchid Island? Anybody know? The wild orchid in the trees on the oak trees is Encyclia tempensis. And it was originally named tempensis because it was discovered originally in Tampa. Um, but this is another species of Encyclia. There are, like I said, there are orchids that bloom in every climate, in every type of sun. There's also orchids that grow at different times of year or that bloom in the different times of year. The encyclias are in the middle of the heat during the summer when most of your cattleyas are not blooming. So these guys are little heat monsters. Um, they'll bloom their hearts out in June, July, um, where most of your cattleyas are either gonna bloom January through April, typically. And then if they're gonna bloom another time in the year, it's gonna be somewhere about October through November, December. So, um, you know, if, if you're looking for stuff, you know, just look to some of these. Do the research on the tags. Pull the tag up, Google it. You'll find some neat stuff in these bag babies. 
I am an avid collector of these things. I will go to the stores and when I see the pallet sitting in the store, I break it open and I get yelled at by two different employees when I do it. So, and actually, there's one down here that's going home with one of you that when I caught it, and this was before I got my shipment in, I went in and busted open the box. I had three different employees that day yell at me. You can't have those yet. I'm like, watch me. So um, I'm going to encourage you to look at these things. Um, there is another tray in the orchid room. I brought one tray out here. Um, take a look at them. You know, look at them because you're going to find some really neat, different stuff in there. Like I said, Rob Palmer over in Sarasota is the head grower from them. I can tell you every one of those plants came from Rob's personal stud plants. So they were developed at his greenhouse and then the babies were shipped off to China, grown out, shipped back, and they're finished out and sold in these bags and shipped out to you guys. This is Florida orchid growing month by month by Dr. Martin Motes in Miami. In this book, it will go month by month and it will tell you what you should be doing with your orchids. If you can't get a hold of me, you can get a hold of this book. Um, the book is $29.95. It is a Bible. You know, I've been growing since 1995. I still find myself going back to this book and double checking myself. Um, this is an invaluable tool. When Dr. Motes wrote it originally, I think he sold out the first publication within two years. And I'm not sure how many books he did, but this is an updated version. Um, and it's got some more information on what to do during hurricanes and cold snaps. So there's new information in this book that's actually pretty incredible. So if you're new to growing orchids, I would highly suggest you pick this book up. It is, it is such a great tool. Now I've, you know, I've been peddling this book through the Orchid Society, um, through some of the shows, um, and everybody that's bought it has just said thank you. That thing helped me out so much. So it's a good book. If you, know, if you guys want these, I do have a stack here. If I run out of those, I do have more in back. So just ask us, we'll get you one. There's some more in the Orchid Room also. Um, I can't recommend a better resource for new orchid growers in the state of Florida. Most of the orchid books that you're going to find out that are published are for people in the Northeast or in Europe. The climate is completely different here than it is um, in those areas. So that book addresses all the issues that we have to deal with. Okay, Inside some of these bags too, you're going to find different types. Um, there are dendrobiums, cataleas, encyclias, um, usually renantheras, which is a type of vanda type plant. Um, so do look at these things, you know, look at the header card. It's going to basically give you an, a rough idea of what the flower is kind of going to look like. Um, but also Google the name on the tag because that Google will pull up the picture of that flower every time. What I want to cover now are the different types of orchids. Everybody knows what these guys are. Yes? No, nope, not a Catalea. Paphopedalium. Or what we commonly refer to as a lady slipper. Okay. How many of you know this is not an orchid? It technically is not an orchid. It's classified as an orchid, but it technically is not an orchid. Um, lady slippers are a lot of fun. They're a little more care. Um, they require a more even um, water application. They do not like to dry out real hard. What happens, and I'm going to use somebody's plant as an example. Hide your head, I see you. Um, what happens is these orchids on the roots have really fine hairs. 
if those fine hairs dry out real hard, the plant goes into, into decline and typically dies. That's what's going on here. Um, unfortunately, the, it got too dry. The, the fine hairs dried out and it's struggling. It looks like it's trying to pop new roots up on the side of the stem. That's what I think it's trying to do. I'm not sure what that is. Um, when you water these guys, keep them evenly moist, not sopping wet. You will rot the root. Now, unfortunately, the grower is shipping them to us in sphagnum moss. I would not recommend keeping these in sphagnum moss. The grower grows them in sphagnum moss so he can go through water once a week or once every two weeks. Um, and that moss will just stay wet enough. For you at home, I would recommend that you move it into a potting, orchid potting type soil mix. Water quality does matter too. Um, real quick, let me ask you, how many of you have well water? Okay, how many of you have a water softener? Do not water your orchids with water softener water. It's got salt in it. Um, it will kill your orchids. If you can set up a rain barrel where you can collect rainwater or use city water, um, do not use water from a water softener. Um, the extra salt will kill your orchids. It will kill ferns too. So if, you, if you've got ferns and you're having problems with it, that's probably what's going on. We did bring in for the first time some intergeneric oncidium types. These guys do extremely well in bright indirect light like you've got underneath this oak tree. They do fabulous. They also do extremely well mounted onto the side of a palm tree. So they'll do really well that way. These especially love to grow in a, in a basket in moss. It's an oncidium. So, um, and in that book, it'll go through the different types too and tell you how to grow them or, or how they like to grow better. Oncidiums, bright indirect light, great plant. Um, as they get bigger, will produce um, a myriad of flower spikes. Just really neat. Catalea, 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 Cat, um, the queen of orchids. Um, Catalea's are typically what were used as um, corsage orchids um, back in the early 1900s to mid 1900s, um, 1950s and so, whatnot. Mamie Eisenhower, I think, was the first one to start wearing them as a corsage as the first lady. Um, and I think every first lady does have an orchid named after her, just like they do with a rose. So um, when I think of orchids, I think of Cattleyas. I don't think of Phalaenopsis. So neat orchids, um, I will tell you though, the bloom period on these in cooler weather is maybe three weeks maximum, unless it's a big plant and you get multiple flower spikes that come over a period. Um, but once the flowers open, you're gonna get about two to three weeks out of them during the cooler weather. If it's blooming in hotter weather, maybe two weeks, okay? So the flowers only last about two weeks. But Cattleyas are probably, the Cattleya family is probably my favorite type of orchid to grow, okay? Now, I'm gonna set that over here because I've got a reason. The next orchid I'm gonna go into are dendrobiums. And there, this is the largest family of orchids. In the, in the group of orchids, there are different families. There's Phalaenopsis, Lady Slippers, um, Vandas, Dendrobiums, um, Bulbophyllums. Um, there's all kinds of varieties. But the dendrobium family is probably the biggest and most diverse. These are the dendrobiums that we're used to seeing. We call these hard cane dendrobiums. 
The deal with these is they do not like to go below 50 degrees. If they go below 50 degrees, they'll drop the leaves and you'll get a bare pseudobulb or cane. And then in the spring, a new growth will come out and you'll get leaves again. Um, they grow during the summer. During the fall and winter, they will spike in flower. Okay, um, this is typically what we are all used to seeing in dendrobiums. Now, this is also a dendrobium. This is a dendrobium noble. These have become extremely popular in the last, what, I'd say five years. Um, this was the dendrobium in the Vero Beach Orchids Society display at Port St. Lucie last year. It took first place for all the dendrobiums in the whole show. Um, I left it outside in front of my shade house on an old birdcage and didn't water it, didn't fertilize it, didn't do anything to it this year. Did nothing to it. Sat in that little pot and it's blooming its little heart out. Um, I brought it in, you know, every week, a couple of times a week, I've been trying to do like mini classes for the staff here to start bringing them up to speed with orchids so they're a little more comfortable with it. And I had this hanging up front. One of our guys up there had a customer that picked it up. She brought it to the register. He tried to sell it for 20 bucks. <laughs> Luckily, I was there to stop him. Um, but, you know, the hard cane dendrobiums, great plant, um, easy to grow, great for putting out in the landscape. If you acclimate them, they will take some full sun. Now, if you're doing full sun, you want to do morning hours for full sun. Um, try to limit the middle of the afternoon. Um, everybody, how many of you have palm trees in your landscape? Okay, you know the difference between self-cleaning palm trees and like the cabbage palms. Self-cleaning palm trees are your Christmas palms, foxtail palms, um, royal palms, stuff like that, okay? That's where the frond and the boot completely fall off and peel off and you get the gray trunk. I like to do them on those trees. I don't like to do royal palms um, because when that boot comes off, it'll, it'll dent your car. Um, so if it falls on the orchid, it's just gonna tear the orchid up. But I will do them on foxtails. I will do them on Christmas palms. I'll do them on um, Phoenix Robolinis. You can do them on Robolinis. You can do them on the dwarf Robolinis, the pygmy date palm, um, especially with the little miniature fails. They'll do real well. Okay. Now the next section I'm gonna go to are Vandas. And I brought a couple of different varieties. Um, like I said, there's an orchid for every um, location in your yard, whether it's bright and direct light or full sun. Vandas typically require a lot brighter light, typically brighter light than Cataleas. So typically you need a little brighter light. Now, I brought in different varieties. to teach you guys about the physiology on Vandas with light. All right, let's, let's think about a leaf as a solar collector. All right, the bigger, wider the leaf, the more light it's trying to collect. The skinnier, thinner leaf, that means it's out in full sun, it doesn't need to collect as much light. So this little pencil cactus type, we call this a Tarit Vanda. This thing grows in full sun all day long. It's on the south side of my greenhouse and it cooks all day. Absolutely roast, even through the summer. Um, these things grow in full sun. Now, with that being said, everybody's used to growing strap leaf Vandas, okay? These are typically what you guys are used to seeing in the stores. 
These are what we call strap leaf vandas. These are the most popular. Um, this is what typically everybody's growing. Now when you cross this with this, you're gonna get this. This is what we call a semi terete all right, that will also live in full sun. You have to acclimate it to it, but it will live in full sun. I grow all my semi treats now out in full sun in a clay pot with a little wire tube running up the center, just like this, um, with it tied to the pot, with it grown in lava rock in the pot. Um, full sun, they get watered every day and they're just happy as a pig in mud. Um, like I said, there are orchids that you can grow in any amount of light, especially the vandas. Now, what's the number one drawback to vandas? Water. Every day. For 20 minutes. Every day. Vandas are, are heavy watering plants. They love a lot of water. The reason being is typically they're not in a pot. They're usually in a basket with the roots hanging down, so they don't have any way to store any water in that pot. Now, there's another piece of physiology on orchids I'm going to show you to tell you that you can determine how often you're going to have to water. It's going to give you an idea of roughly how frequently you need to water an orchid. Um, and I'll cover that in just a second. Now. When people start breeding with this, you get, um, when you cross them with the, the regular Vandas, you go from this to, to what we call quarter treat. You go to semi treat, and then you go to this. So it starts out this, goes to that, goes to this, and then to that. So, this is one end, full sun, the other end, bright and direct light. Okay, the three, in the, the three, you know, the three on this side, not including the strap leaf, will, will, you know, be accustomed, you can acclimate them to full sun. So you can grow this stuff in full sun on the south side of the house and just cook them to death and they'll do okay. But you do have to acclimate them. All right, water them every day. For about 20 minutes, I sit there and spray them. When you see the roots on these guys, the roots are white. Once you spray them down and water them, the roots are gonna start turning green. Once the roots are green, then they're actively taking up moisture. No. If, it's, if you only have one plant, yes. If you have multiple plants, no. Um, if you've got one plant that's got a disease or a fungus and you put it in a bucket of water to soak up water, you take it out, you put it back, and then you take the others behind it and put it in that bucket of water, you just gave everything behind this that had a problem, it's problem. So I don't recommend watering out of a bucket unless it's just one plant. Okay, and usually let them sit in for about five, five to ten minutes, take them out, because they're going to be fully hydrated at that point. They're not going to absorb any more, and then just put them back where you're going to grow them. Okay, now, um, I brought in a couple of examples today of my favorite orchids. Oh, no, I didn't talk about Evelyn. How many have heard the story about Evelyn? The first orchid I ever bought. You guys have heard about it. I know you've heard about Evelyn. All right, the first orchid I ever bought, I bought from Ritter Orchids up in Orlando. It's 1995. Ritter Orchids on, at that point was on Orange Avenue just south of downtown Orlando. I used to go there on my days off and hang out and talk to Tom. It's where I've learned a lot of what I know was watching Tom. You couldn't pry information out of him. You had to watch him do it to get it. Um, the first time I walked in the front greenhouse, his wife, Evelyn, worked the front and did customer service. Tom took care of growing the orchids. 
So I walked in the front greenhouse and I saw this wonderful huge band up, 14 flower spikes on it. It's right around Valentine's Day. And I walked in and I looked at it and I said, is that for sale? Avalon looked at me and said, no. <laughs> I said, okay, do you have any others? No. Okay, um, if you ever divide it, could I put my name down for a piece of it? No, I'm never dividing that orchid. <laughs> Evelyn used to tell everybody Tom was a mean one. <laughs> Bless Evelyn's heart. Um, unfortunately, about six months after that, Evelyn was in the yard mowing the lawn, had a heart attack, and passed away. I showed up in the nursery one day. That big orchid with 14 flower spikes on it hanging in the middle of the front greenhouse was gone. I turned around, looked at Tom. I said, where'd it go? What happened to it? Oh, we took it down, chopped it up. I said, what? I said, do you have any? He goes, yeah. This is it. <laughs> um, ever since, I've had this since 1995. Um, it always blooms for Valentine's Day. It's a little beat up. My greenhouse got too hot this spring. Um, but this is the first time it's put out three flower spikes. So apparently it liked the heat a little more than I thought it would. Um, but it always blooms for Valentine's Day and you know, I've still got it. This is the first time I think I've ever brought it to a talk. So no, you can't buy it. Yeah, they're real light. I mean, they get, I mean, I have really light, light shade cloth with clear plastic over my shade house. I, I put as much light on my orchids as I possibly can. Okay. Now, I told you about Vandas with light. I did not talk to you about the dendrobiums with light. The hard cane, another good one for putting out in the landscape. Um, with full sunlight, if you acclimate it. The Dendrobium nobles, like I said, have become very popular. I recommend that you grow these in a plastic pot in sphagnum moss, not in bark. Grow them in full sun. The only thing is the more sun you're growing it in, growing it in, you're going to have to water it more frequently. Now to get it to bloom like this, there's a trick. You abuse it. You literally, in October, you stop feeding it, you stop watering it. If it's hanging outside, it gets rained on, fine, no problem. Do not put orchid food on this during the winter. And I stop in October, okay? Now, I didn't follow my own advice. All my other Dendrobium nobles are inside the greenhouse. They've been getting fed all along. They don't look nearly this full. So um, these will um, do very well out in the landscape. They're actually suited for our climate. They like cold weather. So if we're going down into the 30s, you don't have to haul this sucker inside. You can leave it outside and it will enjoy that colder weather. Yes? If you stop taking care of it in October, when do you start back taking care of it again? Good question. All right, this is what we call soft cane, Dendrobium noble. Um, the thing with these is when it grows out, it grows out new canes with leaves all over it. In October, when you stop fertilizing it, you stop watering it, all the leaves fall off. They do that on purpose. They go dormant in the winter. Until you get flower spikes, actual buds, not just the flower spike coming out, you have to have defined flower buds on this before you can start feeding it again. You will bloom the daylights out of this thing if you abuse it. Don't fertilize these things in the winter. They're becoming more and more popular. Um, I tried to get three cases. They sold them all out. They're gone for the season. So we won't see these again probably until next year. Um, I, you know, I tried. 
but it just didn't happen this time. So we were a little late. So if you've got any questions, you know, with dendrobiums, they're great plants. I mean, and you just about can't kill them if you know what you're doing. <laughs> um, the little thing up here behind me, that's another type of dendrobium. It's called a callista form of dendrobium. And it does talk about in the book the different varieties of dendrobiums. The callista forms also like a rest period in the winter where they don't get a lot of fertilizer. Um, they don't drop their leaves, but they do like a drying out period and a period where they don't receive any food. Um, when that blooms, the flowers usually last seven to 10 days. That's it, and it's done for a year. Okay, um, we haven't hit, um, well, I brought in a couple of different things. Um, I brought in the Tarit Vanda. This is typically how I'm growing my Tarit Vandas. In a plastic pot with a little wire tube around the bottom of it, with the cuttings attached and potted up with lava rock. I grow them out on the full, full, full sun south side of my greenhouse. Um, and this was probably the smallest one to bring in. I've got a couple that are probably this big around that I couldn't fit in the back of the truck to bring in for show and tell. Um, this other monster back here is the smallest one I've got. The other two are eight and 12 feet. It wouldn't, they wouldn't fit in the truck. One's leaning across the top of my lemon tree. Um, that is, I believe, Anne Black. It is in the Vanda family, full sun, um, grows really great, has a neat looking flower. Um, it's got one spike on this one so far that I can see, I think, I think I've only got one spike coming on this one. Um, the big one at home has 13 flower spikes coming out on it right now. So I, I can't wait till that blooms. Um, another orchid that'll grow in full sun. These are the types of orchids that do really well around the base of a palm tree and that will attach to a palm tree if the boots are cleaned off. Um, if you're ready and willing to water them every day, just spray them down. They'll do great out in the landscape. Wonderful orchid. Now, the one thing I didn't talk about yet were the Schomburkias. I'm a Schomburkia, uh, you know, freak. Just, if I can find something that's got Schomburkia in it, I'm buying it. That's what the majority of my collection at home is, and there's a reason for that. Schomburkias will take full sun. Um, they're hardy, you just about, can't kill them, um, and they'll grow like a weed here in Florida. Schomburkias are these guys. Um, those flower spikes aren't even half grown yet. There's, some of you have heard the story, there's a, a house out on the island off of A1A on Fiddlewood that has one of these in the center of an oak tree. Like this oak tree goes up and divides. They started one off down at the bottom and it went up both branches. Um, it's as big as our dumpster out back. Um, when it flowers, the flower spikes are about 20 feet around the diameter of the tree and they're just everywhere. Um, the house that was on that lot was just torn down. They're building a new house. That gentleman actually sent the Orchid Society an email and I had to go out and talk to him and educate him, tell him what it was, how to take care of it, what to do, what not to do. Um, so it's a really neat orchid. It's been up there since 1955. It's handled all the freezes, the hurricanes. It has gone through heck and back and still, it, you know, it's like a Timex. It took a licking and kept on ticking. Um, it just keeps going. Um, great plant. If you get a chance, come up and feel leaves. They're like cardboard. Insects don't typically affect them like they do the other orchids. So they're great landscape plants. Um, the only drawback with these is on the Schomburgias, at the base of the pseudobulb, there is a little hole 
and you will find that ants will go and nest up inside the pseudobulbs. Y'all are gonna scream, but they're actually hollow on the inside and the ants will nest inside them. That's normal. Schomburgia, S-C-H-O-M-B-U-R-G-K-I-A, I believe. Um, now there's, they've taken that group of orchids and divided it into two classes. Schomburgias have gone into Myrmacophila. Myrmacophila now are the ones with the hollow pseudobulbs. Lalias, which are also Schomburgias, some Lalias, which is another form of Cattleya, um, does not have a hollow pseudobulb. So there is a difference. Okay. Now, the reason I'm showing you the Schomburgias is because a lot of people will take them and hybridize them with a standard Cattleya. When they, when they hybridize them with a standard Cattleya, instead of getting a real tall flower spike, if I don't beat myself up with it, um, they get a shorter flower spike with a bigger flower. Schomburgias typically have a kind of a funky shaped flower to it. But when you cross them with Cattleyas, you get a bigger flower, you get a shorter flower spike, and you get a fantastic orchid specimen for the landscape. As time goes on, some of the palm trees on the south side of this property will start having some Shambo cats tied to them. So keep your eyes open. Um, how many of you think orchids are delicate and temperamental? Oh, they're, they're sturdy as a rock, all right? Temperamental, no. The only thing with orchids is too much water. This thing has been sitting on the top of my orchid bench for four years. Just four years. I've done nothing to it. You know, it gets fed, it gets watered, it's not in a pot, it's not in a basket, and it just keeps ticking. Yes, ma'am. depending on how often I'm watering it. Um, now I'm in the process, you know, I've been rebuilding a lot of my orchid benches. So I'm getting ready to go through and repot everything. So I'm gonna be dividing and repotting. I'm also making room in the greenhouse. Um, another example of a Cattleya is this little guy. He's in the pot with no potting material. It's been sitting in the greenhouse for three years. This came from one of the ladies that passed away in the Orchid Society. This is one of her plants, and this is how she had it. She didn't put it in a pot. Um, she didn't put it in a basket, and it's blooming its little heart out. It's actually Dendrobium noble. It's a species. Yes, you do. When you don't have any potting material, there's no way for them to hold a little moisture in the pot and be able to pull moisture from it. So when they're bare root like this or they're mounted on a tree, you do have to water more frequently, okay? And I'll cover that when we do an orchid mounting class. And I'll cover that for you guys just to give you guys a better idea. Now the Schomburgias, you think, my God, I don't want to grow a Schomburgia. Look at the size of that thing. It'll take up, you know, the whole back porch or whatever. There are different species of Schomburgias. Um, kind of slow growers. They're not real fast growers. Um, it'll take, you know, I've had that for what? Three, three or four pseudobulbs for like five years and that's as big as it's gotten. I've not taken or cut anything off of it. So it will get there. Um, I bought this two years ago at Redlands. Put it on the piece of wood um, it bloomed for me last year. And I've got one flower spike coming up out of the top. It'll be about two months before I see flowers. But it is coming. Um, this is actually a, a, 
Yeah, it is Al Alba purpurea. They've renamed it Thomsoniana variety Alba purpurea. Um, it's a little white flower with a purple lip and it's native to, I believe, yeah, Grand Cayman. So you can find this species growing wild on Grand Cayman. All right. Now. We've talked about everything there. I want to talk to you about potting. When you grow, yes ma'am. Those are epidendrums. Those are what we call the poor man's orchid. Um, actually, when orchids started arriving, they didn't just, you know, people didn't go to South America, discovered these orchids in the landscape, started taking them and growing them. When they were going to South America to, to collect plant samples, they would crate them up, pack them in crates, um, and to use for um, packing material, they would take the orchids off the tree and pack them in the boxes to hold the other plant material in place. Well, they would open up the crates, you know, bring them out. Every once in a while, one would flower while it's inside the crate. So, so they discovered, you know, you know, something different. So they've started growing them. Um, back before you could get catalayas, you know, a simple catalaya like that little dendrobium noble, you'd buy for two, three hundred dollars. And for a back division, the back end of it with, you know, maybe a couple of leaves on it. Um, the prices come down considerably, but that's why these were called the poor man's orchids. Everybody could afford them. You're, not everybody could afford that. So the, the orchid hobby has come a long way. Now, everybody's familiar with repotting in orchid bark. Everybody knows the Better Grow orchid bark? Yes? How many of you have used this before? Okay. How often do you have to repot with this stuff? Anybody know? Currently. Go ahead. Every year. Yep. I love this stuff. It's great. But if you want to repot every year, use it. Um, with orchid bark in the state of Florida, with the rains we get during the summer, the humidity that we get, this stuff breaks down and turns to mud in a pot. And what happens with the orchids when the pot doesn't dry out is the roots rot. And that's when the plant starts to go into decline. So you have to repot and put them back into fresh mix. Now I've done something. Um, I brought in a new mix. Where is it? Where to go? I brought in um, what is called Orchiata orchid bark. All right, this is from, um, where is it? So I don't mispronounce the name. Okay. It's an orchid bark that comes from New Zealand first, but it's a specific type of fir tree, and it's Pinus radiata bark. The nice thing about this stuff is, is it does not decompose and rot like the other stuff. Say you buy one bag of that and you repot your orchids, next year you're going to have to buy another bag and repot, the following year you're going to have to buy another bag and repot, the following year, you're going to have to buy another bag and repot. This, you can go up to seven years without repotting. <laughs> no, it's not volcanic. It's actually orchid bark. It's tree bark. Um, you literally do not have to repot as often as you do with the other orchid barks. This stuff is wonderful. Um, I brought it in. It will save you money. It will save you time. Um, I'm shooting myself in the foot on my sales on the other stuff, 
but I'm educating you and making less work for you. Orchids, when you grow them in a pot, the bark usually breaks down. It is recommended that you repot if it's in bark every two years to sweeten that mix up so that when you water it, water goes through it and doesn't sit in there. Like I said, the number one killer of orchids is water. So if those roots don't have a chance to dry out, they're gonna rot. This will allow those pots to drain out without breaking down. And you'll find that with the other bark, as, as time goes on, it actually turns to almost like a dirt compost type mix. Um, and it, it just stays wet, it never dries out. So I love this. Some of my bigger plants at home are in this. And I can tell you right now, I have not repotted in probably seven years. This year, I've got to repot everything. Clay pot, plastic pot. Good question. Where would you grow a clay pot? In Florida. Where? In my city. Right. All right. Now, if you're, do you have a screen porch or anything like that? I have a screen house with the orchid. Okay. Is it covered over the top? Yes. Okay. The, it's covered where it doesn't get any rain. Okay. Any of you growing on a screened-in porch where you have a roof where it doesn't get rained on? Okay. There's an issue with that. If you're growing Phalaenopsis, um, the moth orchids, I would recommend that you grow them in moss if they're under cover. If you're in, the, if you're in a screened enclosure, you can grow them out there, but grow them in bark. The reason is you want them to dry out a little bit in between watering. So if they're underneath cover, all you have to do is water them once a week. You don't have to worry about the summer rain. So you can pot them in moss. That's just the Phalaenopsis. The Cattleyas and everything else, I would recommend that you pot them in bark, even if you're enjoying them underneath the covered porch where they still get morning light, you should still be growing that in bark. Now, if you're growing out underneath a tree in a basket, I would recommend in bark. If it's Phalaenopsis, you can do them in moss. Be careful because if we get rains every afternoon, you know, that moss will stay wet, it won't dry out. So just, you, you have to use your own judgment on that. Um, if you're growing them in a screened area, I would grow them in, in bark. In a clay pot. In a clay pot. Now the difference between clay and, and plastic pots is what? Moisture. Right. Plastic pots retain moisture. They don't evaporate through the side of the pot. A clay pot is porous. It will actually wick. And I'm gonna pass this around. I'll let you guys look at this. I will start down on the end. This is the super size. This stuff is wonderful. Um, I use the super size myself because it's a bigger, chunkier bark. It also is easier to use in the baskets because it doesn't fall through the basket. You may have to put a little bit of screening in the bottom to hold it in, but typically it's, it's a better bark. It's much better product. Um, we actually had an orchid grower named Paul Storm that specialized in the Shambo cats, the Schomburkia and Cattleya crosses, and the Schomburkias. Um, and he turned everybody on to it. He was the first person to start selling it um, and promoting it, and it has taken off like wildfire. The only problem with that is before now, the only places you can get it is Orlando or Miami. The Orchiata orchid bark. And I carry it, I carry it in the big bags, um, two different sizes. There's a super size, which is a three quarter inch to one inch bark chunk. And then I carry a power size. They, it's New Zealand, so they're gonna name everything a little bit differently. Um, they also carry it in liters instead of gallons or pounds. Um, these are 40 liter bags. Um, they're, the sizes on them are either super or power plus. Now the little bags are just straight power, which is a smaller orchid size. I recommend the two bigger sizes. 
because they just drain better. The orchid roots like it a lot better. Okay, now, um, am I going to tell you to stop using the Better Grow mix? No. If you want to use that, use that. Um, but I'm going to push the Orchiata on you as much as I can because it is going to save you money and it is going to save you time. Um, I love it. Now, as far as the orchid bark, when you're potting up in a clay pot, um, you wanna use an orchid pot with the holes or slots in it. Um, getting an orchid pot bigger than the eight inch pot is almost impossible now. The main, main manufacturer that was making them shut down. So if you've got the old, skinnier, not as tall um, orchid pots that are a little bit bigger, hold on to them. Don't break them if you have to, um, to get the plan out. Just try and save them because you just can't get them anymore. Um, if you have to go to a bigger size pot, you can't find holes on it. Um, I would recommend that you put a layer in the bottom of either peanuts, styrofoam peanuts, or gravel. Um, what that does is it makes sure that the water drains down through the pot and it will go down through the hole in the bottom of the pot and that the roots don't sit in that water while it's draining, okay? Unfortunately, the bigger pots are just hard to find. I'm lucky enough that I've been able to get some bigger ones from some people, um, but they're just, they're real hard to find anymore. And they're expensive. Yes, sir. Yes. But here only or? Uh, it's here available here, or it's available in Miami, or it's available in Orlando. I brought it in, we have to buy it by the pallet. Um, and we have to pay for shipping on it. Um, the big bag is $42.99. The small bags are $12.99. This is $8.99, multiply $8.99 times, you know, seven. Okay, and that's gonna dictate the price compared to the Orchiata. It's instant savings. You can't beat it. And almost any orchid can be planted in it? The Orchiata, just about any orchid except for um, Slippers, I would, the lady slippers, I would not pot the slippers in them, yes. Good question. You're the only person that caught that. I'll tell you in just a second. Okay, just like bark, with the humidity and the heat that we have down here, especially with the rain, everybody uses sphagnum moss for your phalaenopsis. Okay, this you have to get wet first. You have to let it soak up the water. You have to take it out, put it in a bucket, let it fluff up, and then you have to pot it up with this. Sphagnum moss has to be repotted every year. It decomposes and rots in the state of Florida. Now up north, if, if you go north for part of the year, up north it'll last the whole year without a problem. Down here in the state of Florida, this stuff rots almost in a year. For, right. Not helping, hold your plan up, hold it up. Yes, that's the way, hey look, if you guys bring in plants as examples, you know, I'm not making an example of you I'm helping you guys to learn. Hold that sucker up. All right, see how the leaves are all drooping down the side? They're not supposed to do that. <laughs> Phalaenopsis leaves want to stand up. How thick are they? Are they kind of thin? Yeah. See, they're not getting enough water. Um, what happens is when they don't get enough water, they will absorb the moisture out of the leaf and it will thin, get thin on you. Now, there's, there's, there's an alternate side to that. 
is if you're overwatering it and the roots rot off of it, it has no way to absorb water, so it's gonna thin out again until it produces new leaves or new roots. And then once it starts producing new leaves, they'll come back out thicker. Right. Well, the, the, if you're gonna grow it, if you're gonna grow it under cover, I would, I would recommend putting it in plastic and then tucking it down in the clay pot for decoration. But keep it in plastic, it'll help hold that moisture in a little bit better for you. Okay? Now, um, I want to talk about fertilizers, um, and then I want to talk about some pesticides and fungicides. Um, yes? I don't recommend growing anything else in moss except for the Dendrobium noble. That the dendrobium nobles you can grow in moss in full sun here but because those are super fast growing during the spring you can water them every day and they're just going to love you because they're out in full sun i recommend growing them out in full sun now if i took that plant you know and i bought it at a nursery i took it home and shoved it out in full sun leaves are going to burn on it that's not an issue with dendrobium nobles because in the fall all the leaves are going to fall off of it anyways so to acclimate into full sun in this area you want to be doing it january through the end of march we're kind of pushing it now we're midway into march we're coming into april we've already had extremely warm afternoons the sun's getting a lot brighter you can see my face is red because i've been in full sun for the last three weeks <laughs> My nose is peeled twice. Um, just like me, you know, the orchid's gonna do the same thing. Um, on the Dendrobium nobles, like I said, if you do burn the leaves on it, it, don't worry. Because in the fall, in October, when you stop feeding it, fertilizing it, they're gonna drop all their leaves anyways. They're designed to do that. They're supposed to drop their leaves, okay? That'll help you with those guys. Um, Dendrobium nobles, you know, we used to see them, I would say about 15 years ago. Um, everybody would buy them, they'd take them home, and they would kill them. Because they would continue, and they'd never get any flowers on them. Because they would continue to water and fertilize during the winter. Um, a friend of mine down in Fort Lauderdale grows all of his stuff on the east side of the house, in sphagnum moss, in full sun. He took one of these Dendrobium nobles, that he bought in a little four inch pot, took it home, grew the stinker out, took it in for AOS judging down at Flamingo Gardens in Fort Lauderdale and had 380 flowers on the dang thing. He walked in, the AOS judges all went. Now he's in the judging program because of that. <laughs> so they figured out he knew what he was doing. John's a good friend. He knows what he's talking about with dendrobiums. He does run a dendrobium Facebook group. It's dendrobium species in, in, on Facebook. Um, I am one of the moderators for that group also. Um, I usually stay to the background. I let John pretty much run it. Um, if problems pop up, I, I interject, but I try to stay off of Facebook as much as possible. As, you know, as I can. Um, but some of the orchid groups are really good. There is, if you're new into orchids, there is a group called Newbie Florida Orchid Growing. There's also a group called Florida Orchid Growing. There are some people in Florida Orchid Growing, they're just egomaniacs. Yeah. So that's why I've stuck with the Newbie group. It's, it's a much more polite group. Um, some of the more advanced growers around the state that are in Florida orchid growing um, are not very polite or kind if you show a picture. <laughs> so they can be bullies. Um, there's nothing worse than an orchid grower. <laughs> oh no, dog breeders have nothing on some orchid growers. 
So um, the newbie Florida orchid growing is a good group. You can get some good advice from it, but you've got me, so what do you need them for? So um, what I want to talk to you about is fertilizer. How many of you um, feed maybe once every six months? Stick your hands up. Once a month? Shame on you. All right. I have a watering system at home that's called a fertilizer injector. Every time I turn my water on, I have a fertilizer concentrate that gets sucked up from a barrel and gets injected into the fertilizer line or the water line. So every time I'm watering, my plants are getting a little bit of food. I'm pushing my plants. You guys at home, all right, should be fertilizing at least once every two weeks. I would prefer that you fertilize once a week. But sometimes life gets busy and hectic and you forget. So there's a couple of ways around that. Um, where to put them? There they are. When I talk about orchid fertilizer, typically I'm going to tell you I don't care what variety of orchid fertilizer you put on it as long as you are putting some kind of food on it. When you look at these plants, whatever they're potted in, whether it be bark or sphagnum moss, lava rock, whatever, it is, there's no nutritional value inside that pot you have to put a water-soluble fertilizer on your orchids. Now, if you're lazy, yes, I'm looking at you. If you forget to water them sometimes um, with fertilizer, what you can do is use the slow-release pellets each spring, put about a tablespoon around the top of each pot. Every time you water, it's going to give it a little bit of food. Anytime you repot an orchid, put a tablespoon of this on top of the orchid. So when you water, a little bit of food gets released. All right, how many of you have heard of Osmocote? Don't use Osmocote. How many of you have heard of Dynamite? Dynamite was the stuff in the red tube at Home Depot and Lowe's. It was a slow release silver colored pellet. You can use that. Um, Better Grow is now using, and they're not going to tell you the company name that they're getting this from, but this is a form of Osmocote. It's now called Sunny Coat. Um, it is an Osmocote that is designed to put on orchids for slow release. Do not use Osmocote, okay? Do not use Osmocote that you would use on your regular flowers. It will burn the roots on your orchid. Okay. Yeah, it, it's orchid fertilizer. I'd rather use that than nothing. I don't, you know, as far as, you know, I'm gonna tell you to use this. Um, I'm working to bring in another fertilizer um, that's been proven. Um, actually, Rob Palmer over in Sarasota came up with a formula. Um, he also developed these two formulas. Um, he is the head grower for Sunbulb. He's the one that came up with these two formulas. He now has a formula that mimics the Michigan State Orchid Fertilizer formula. Um, it's much better. I've Tried to have it here for this weekend. Unfortunately, I couldn't get it. Um, it comes in a 25 pound bag and an eight pound bag. So I'm still working on that. Um, if you're kind of scared of a 25 pound bag of fertilizer, if you only have a couple of orchids, get a couple of people together, buy a bag, split it up. Um, the stuff really works, it's fantastic. Orchids have different seasons. Um, like the Dendrobium noble or the Aggregatum, um, they have a winter rest period. So, you know, sometimes the book will tell you what to water, what not to water. Um, 
try and follow those examples as best as possible, but that book is, is absolutely invaluable. When you're watering and fertilizing, if you're in clay pots and you're in bark, in Florida, you sh probably should be watering twice a week. All right, one time a week it's gonna be water, the other time food, optimally. All right, well, the instructions on the back of the bag usually tell you, see if I remember, it's usually a teaspoon per gallon, and I don't have my glasses on, so I'm blind as a bat right now. Yep, one teaspoon per gallon of water um, to put on your orchids. Um, I usually cut it in half of what the bag says, but I'm watering every day with water and fertilizer. So I make a weekly mix and it gets applied weekly. Now, my stuff gets applied, you know, every two days. Um, all the Cataleas in the main house are getting fertilized twice a week, okay? This, if you're at home once a week, um, is perfect. Now, the thing with this is you're gonna see, you're gonna see two formulas. One's an Orchid Bloom Booster, one's Orchid Plus. Orchid Plus, you wanna use three weeks of the month. The fourth week of the month, use the Bloom Buster, or Bloom Booster. Not buster. <laughs> Thrips are bloom busters. Um, but use this once a month. Use this the rest of the time. Okay. Now that Michigan State fertilizer um, formula that we're trying to get in, um, it's a magnesium calcium fertilizer with seaweed extract in it. Um, it's a very good fertilizer. All the top orchid growers all over the state have all switched to it, myself included. Um, it's a wonderful fertilizer, so I'm still fighting to get it in. With their open house this weekend, they kind of dropped the ball on um, getting a hold of us so we could get that stuff here. Now, here's the kicker. Um, how many of you know the old fertilizer plant out on 41st Avenue? Just up from the Sheriff's Department? Guess where all this stuff is made? but I can't buy it here in Vera Beach. <laughs> so it's all made up right out here on 41st Avenue at the old miracle Grow fertilizer plant. Um, this stuff too. This stuff goes out across the country and around the world. It's all made here in Vero Beach. It just gets shipped out to better grow in the middle of the state and then it gets distributed worldwide. It's, I mean, it's a, one of the best fertilizer succulent or fertilizers that you can use. There is a company called Jack's, um, Jack's Classic. Um, we do usually carry that. We are back ordered. We can't get it right now. Um, for some reason, it's just been crazy. Um, how many of you have new orchids? You're potting them. You're trying to get the roots established. the best thing you can use to get your roots established on an orchid. A couple of, it's liquid seaweed. It's iodine. It's, it's kelp, right? It's kelp, seaweed. Yep. It's one of the best additives that you can add to your orchids to help produce new roots. I just got this in. Um, I ordered it in the gallon size and this. Unfortunately, all I got was a pint size, but for you guys, the homeowner was a small amount. This is probably the right bottle for you guys. For me, it's the gallon size. Through water with your fertilizer. Just follow the instructions, add it to your fertilizer mix. You can, you can put it on with your fertilizer. You can mix them both together. It's not gonna hurt a thing. All right. If you can stand fish, liquid fish, go ahead. If your neighbor's cats love you, don't. All right. Um, we've covered fertilizer. When you apply fertilizer, um, 
the plants dry, you mix up your fertilizer spray, say in a pump up sprayer, you mix it up, you shake it up, you pump up the sprayer, you go to spray it on the orchid, what happens? No, it won't kill them. It just runs right through the pot and right out through the bottom and doesn't stick on the plant. Okay, with orchids, you want to try and keep that fertilizer on the plant as long as possible. How many of you are familiar with, and I know you two are, because you've heard my talk before, um, heard the term spreader sticker. Okay, who knows what a spreader sticker is? It's soap, all right? Just like you taking a shower and washing your hair. Every morning when you take a shower, you wash your hair. If you don't rinse that residue out from the shampoo, it's in your hair, okay? The thing with any fertilizer, any pesticide, or any fungicide, use a spreader sticker. What happens is that spreader sticker absorbs that chemical, either the pesticide or the fungicide, or the fertilizer, and it sticks to the plant. It doesn't just, you know, you pour it on the orchid, it waters right through the pot and it just doesn't get absorbed. It actually leaves a residue on the plant so that it actually has a chance to absorb it. Okay? I always will recommend a spreader sticker every time you put a fertilizer, a, you know, a fungicide or a pesticide on your plants. Now, th this you don't have to worry about putting it on a plant and being in full sunlight. Okay. The only time that you need to be careful about any pesticide or fungicide or something like that is if it is an oil-based product. All right, if you're using something like neem oil, be really careful, especially in Florida. You will fry your plants like an egg in a cast iron skillet. Um, if you go back in the orchid house, when you walk in right where the orchid house is, the box that they shipped us, we have three Vandas that came in with heat burns on them. Um, and you will cook your orchids like that. Um, so be careful with any type of oil mix. I'm going to recommend that you use the horticultural spreader sticker, which is just basic soap. I use palm olive. I used to, yeah, you know, I've got a couple of friends that use Dawn. I don't like Dawn. Dawn is great for washing your dog if you've got fleas. Um, it kills fleas on contact. It also strips all the natural oils. So it strips the natural oils off the plant. Just like you, you, know, you take a, a pot, put it in a sink full of water, and the grease starts floating up. You put a drop of Dawn in the top, and the grease just goes away from it. It does the same thing to a plant. So when you mix palm olive with an oil base, it emulsifies it just like a salad dressing and makes it incorporate so it will spread and stick. Now I use this in my fertilizer mix. Yeah, because I'm, you know, I'd be going through a gallon of that every two days the way I, I spray. Usually about a tablespoon to a gallon of water and fertilizer. Okay, um, and that's on regular soap. If the plant has been sitting dry for a long time and you've forgotten to water it, it's hard as a brick, yes, water it before you water, fertilize or put a pesticide or fungicide on it. She's bringing up a point, okay? I have gone to Palmer, Ritter, Odom's, Jim Roberts, um, Martin Motes, Robert Fuchs, all in Miami. You can ask each one of these experts the same question, you're gonna get a different answer from each one of them. Um, find somebody that you know that is growing orchids well in your area, pick their brain. Now, one of our guys here likes to use the term probe their brain. We are not doing alien experiments, ask questions. How many know what the stupid question is that you will ever ask about an orchid? Exactly. All right. I started in 1995, didn't know the first thing about an orchid. I looked at it and said, I'm going to kill it. Now, how many of you know what no are? Every one of you should have your hands up. 
and I mean every one of you. No CMs are thrips. Thrips are these little itty bitty grains of black rice that fly around and suck the living blood out of your plants. They're vicious little critters. They have a little rasping mouth that sits there and scrapes the top of the tissue. Then they come back and drink the fluid that's coming up from the plant. They will blast the flower on an orchid in a heartbeat. When you're using your fertilizer or a pesticide or a fungicide, soap kills on contact on thrips. Even if I'm not um, fungiciding or, or using a pesticide, I use soap every time when I'm putting fertilizer on. Now with my stuff at home, that's every time the water goes off. There's actually soap and fertilizer in my water. You at home, what you're gonna do is you can use a pump up sprayer or you can, how many of you have a miracle Grow hose in fertilizer sprayer? Use that. You put one pound of fertilizer, you know, one bag in the bucket, put a couple of tablespoons of soap in there, fill it up with water, screw it back on, Put it on the hose, turn it on, you're good to go. It takes away all the headaches, all the nightmares. It's wonderful. Earlier yeah. you said don't get water on the flowers. Right. Phalaenopsis flowers don't get water on the flowers. It causes that botrytis little okay. pencil spot fungus, especially on the whites. It doesn't so much on the colors, but it will do it on the whites in a blink of an eye, so just like that. I strongly suggest on the fails not to get the flowers wet. The catalayas and stuff, it really doesn't matter. Now, these guys have been out in the, the landscape all winter, not been brought in in the cold. Flowers were a little beat up, um, but they were stuffed in between two citrus trees, um, and I just let them grow. Um, now, I didn't turn the fertilizer system on them all winter, because it was a little bit cooler, they were not growing as fast, so I held back on them. Um, and you can see some of the damage on the flowers from thrip. Um, it's just, thrips are, you know, it's a never ending battle in Florida. So you're gonna fight them. One of the best tools that you can use is just basic soap. Nobody realizes that, you know, Tom Ritter used to run around with a big vat, like a dumpster that he had on skids that he would drag up and down with a tractor um, that had a pump mounted on the front of it with a hose and he'd drag it into the greenhouse. He'd sit there and take that vat, fill it up with um, water, dump two bags of fertilizer in it and dump two big bottles and you're gonna laugh at me. I can't find it anymore. It's whisk laundry detergent. It's a basic spreader sticker and he'd sit there and mix it up in the tank before he'd go through and spray it on all his vandas. That man could make an oak tree bloom a vanda flower. I'm not kidding. We lost Tom two years ago, unfortunately. I, mean, I think Tom was like 98. Um, the man could grow any kind of orchid. It's just amazing. One of the best growers I think I've ever met. Most of the stuff that I've learned through the years came from a basic knowledge I got from him. Okay. Now, pesticides. I've told you one way to handle some insects without having to go to pesticides. Um, any of the pesticides you use? Who knows the difference between systemic and topical? This, uh, define systemic. Okay, no. Goes into the ground and comes up through the roots. Yeah. You're halfway right. So, yeah. Systemic means, it doesn't mean that it goes into the ground. Systemic means that it gets absorbed into the tissue of the plant. Topical means that you just spray it and it goes onto the top of the plant and it doesn't get into the tissue of the plant. If you have fruit trees, you never or any vegetable plants, you never want to use a systemic insecticide. 
because you're eating poison. Okay, it, with the flowers, it's a little bit different. Um, you can use these, these chemicals um, without any problems. Follow the directions for flowering ornamentals um, and use them safely. Wear long sleeves, wear a mask, wear gloves. If you get systemics on you, wash it off with soap and water. I've seen one woman here in Indian River County with brain cancer that died in a year. I've got another person I know that has serious lung damage from going in his greenhouse and spraying with fungicides and pesticides without wearing a mask, wearing a, a short white t-shirt, shorts, and flip-flops. Okay, be smart about this stuff. They're poison. They're designed to kill insects. They're gonna do the same thing to you. So just be careful. If anybody have pet birds, I have pet birds. Don't spray this stuff around your birds. Okay. Now there's several different types. There's orthene, um, which is surrender. It's a white powder. It stinks. Once you open the can, um, you put it in your garage, you're going to smell it in the garage when the garage has been closed up for a while. Um, Orthene is what everybody uses. Um, it, the chemical name is acephate. It's what they use for fire ants. It does a wonderful job of killing thrips. Okay, I like it. It works really good, but I'm also very respectful and careful with it. Everybody knows what malathion is. Everybody's heard of malathion? Okay. You can use malathion, it is extremely stinky, you're gonna smell it, it's just malathion. It is a topical, it is not a systemic. So it doesn't get sucked into the tissue. Um, so you can use this without having to worry about it getting absorbed into your skin. Still wash yourself off with soap and water, but be mindful of that. Now, I do have the high yield systemic insect spray. This is a different chemical. This is metacloprid. How many of you have seen Bayer insecticide three in one stuff in the big box stores? Same chemical, same, same, it does the same thing. Um, this is a hose in sprayer, so you don't have to do any mixing. Um, you can probably open it. I, I'm not sure if you can open this up or not. Um, if, you, if you really wanted to, you could probably open it up, add a couple of tablespoons of soap to it. Um, it may not be necessary with it. I'm just fussy. I like to add soap to everything, so I usually don't use a hose-in sprayer. I have a sprayer or I run it through my fertilizer system. Um, this is a metacloprid. It is systemic, so it does get sucked into the tissue of the plant. Now, any of the systemics, you can't just put it on one time and expect it to work. You have to put it on twice, all right? And that's usually about every, what, 10 to 14 days apart. Um, you need to do that double dose, just like the COVID vaccine. You've gotta have two shots for it to work correctly, okay? That, that way it builds up enough in the tissue of the plant so that if Insects do come like scale or thrips. Um, it will kill them off and they won't continue to feed on the plant. Okay, that's basic, basic chemical, all right? Now, if you're scared of the pesticides, we do have a couple of options that are natural. Anything that's made with pyrethrin, which is made from chrysanthemums, it's a natural insecticide. You can use that. Neem oil is a natural. I am going to recommend that you stay away from neem oil because it's an oil. Um, this time of year, as it starts getting hotter and hotter, you will cook your orchids if you put neem oil on your orchids. Um, the organicide, if I remember correctly, this is like garlic, and I forget what else is in here. Sesame oil, this does have oil in it, so be careful with it on your plants, on your orchids. Yes, ma'am. Insecticidal soap will work. 
Um, sometimes some of these insects are a little more um, stubborn and insecticidal soap won't typically do it completely. It'll help, but it won't solve it completely. Now, if you've got an orchid that you've noticed, you pick up a leaf and you see some mealy bug or scale on the bottom side of it, put it on a cotton ball, wipe it off. Rubbing isopropyl alcohol. How many of you see orchids crawling up the flower spikes on your orchids? Ants, sorry, ants crawling up the flower spikes on your orchids. All right, typically don't worry about that. What they're doing is they're going for the honeydew or the syrup that the flower forms and they're going up to get that to drink and they're going off. Now watch it on some plants. Um, make sure that they're not carrying around little scale or mealybug because they will farm scale and mealybug for the honeydew that that insect emits as a byproduct. It's actually their urine um, because the ants will farm them for that honeydew. Um, just be careful that the ants aren't carrying around little insects on your plant. Um, do I worry about ants and the orchids? No. Um, like I said, my stuff at home is getting soap on it, so I pretty much keep the ants out of my greenhouse. Occasionally I'll see some, like if all of a sudden we have a really bad rainstorm and the ground really floods out, you know, be careful because you'll see fire ants will crawl up and nest inside your orchid pots. If you see that, just douse them with soapy water, they'll get out of there. So anything will, that, will do that. Fungicides, how many of you have heard of liquid copper? Okay, do not use liquid copper on your orchids. Do not use copper anything on your orchids. It kills dendrobiums, it kills catacetums, it kills bromeliads, um, and there's another couple of varieties of orchids it does kill. Copper does not kill catalaeus, but it will kill other varieties, bubble phylums, catacetums, dendrobiums, it will kill them. So you need to use a different fungicide. There are several different ones that you can use. And we do carry all three. I try to make sure that we have them all in stock on a regular basis. Thiamil, $12.99 for a little bottle. This is gonna last you a lifetime. Um, it's a white powder. When you mix it up with your water, do not breathe the powder. Make sure it goes in the water. Um, if you have to, wear a mask while you're mixing it up. Shake it up, add your soap to it. Um, probably one of the best fungicides that you can use. Anybody here have Vandas? You've heard of Thai crud? You, I know you have. Thai crud is a really infectious type of um, Vanda disease that gets like little, like diamond, elongated diamond, like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, Striation, no. Kind of like an indentation. It's a rough like callus um, on the leaf. When, when the Vandas get that Thai crud disease, you have to strip the leaves off the Vanda until you have leaves that don't show it anymore and you have to spray this. This is the only thing that will control Thai crud with Vandas. Um, and in Florida, they're really susceptible to Thai crud. So if you get one with Thai crud, get it away from the rest of your plants. What's the number one spreader of disease with orchids? Water, I heard it. Water, especially with fungus. Fungus, every fungus is carried and transported by water. So, you know, a good fungicide is, is almost something you can't do without. Um, you can use Dithane M45. It is a yellow powder and it tends to cake up when you mix it up. So when you're mixing it and spraying it, you have to shake it up in the bottle or the sprayer um, to make sure that it's mixed up and, and you know, 
mix up into the water. Um, captan, you can use captan also. So it's another one. Now, as far as systemic goes with fungicides, this is your systemic. These are your topicals. So this is the one that's gonna do the most good. Um, and usually before the beginning of our rainy season, which is typically May, I've hit my orchids at least twice, um, usually in May before the rainy season hits. Because you know there'll, there'll be days where we go day after day after day after day, it rains. And that's when fungus, fungus starts showing up. That's when rot starts showing up, okay? I spray fungicide on mainly the plant itself. You can spray it on the flowers. It's not going to really do any good. Um, most of your fungus is going to attack the plant and not the flower. Okay, except for the one fungus, Botrytis, which puts the little pencil dots on the flowers. Okay. All right. Now, as far as growing out in the landscape with orchids, um, you can grow them in just about anything. You can see I've got stuff growing in just plastic pots or clay pots. Um, you know, I've got them growing on pieces of bark or driftwood. If you decide to pull driftwood out of the river, if it's coming out of salt water, don't use it. Not for orchids. Um, that wood is impermeated, in, right. Um, the wood is permeated with salt from the river, um, and you can't get that salt back out of that, wa out of that wood. I, it doesn't matter how long you soak it and change that water, that salt's always going to be in that wood. Um, if you can get a hold of cypress wood that comes from fresh water, yeah, use it. It'll do great. Um, when I first started doing orchids in the landscape for people, I was taking them out of the pots, bare rooting them, putting them on the tree, putting some moss over the top of the roots, tying them on. The problem I've had with doing that is um, the rabbit's foot type ferns that come in this area grow in that moss really well. Um, and ferns will compete against the orchid for the fertilizer you're putting on them. The fern will absorb the fertilizer before the orchid does. It'll drink it all up before the orchid even has a chance to drink it up. So I, I don't use moss anymore. What I will do is if I've got a bare root orchid on a tree, I will hang Spanish moss just around the base of the plant where the roots are because it'll keep enough humidity in there but it won't encourage those rabbit foot type um, ferns to grow. When you're buying it, one, you, you should be buying an orchid. It should be free of disease or bugs. You know, look for it. Where's the number one place that insects hide? Underneath the leaf. Down in the cracks and crevices where the leaf meets the pseudobulb on the plant that's where they're going to hide. Um, they will hide down in the potting material also. Just check, check the plants. I mean, if, if they've got bugs or insects on them, walk away from it. You don't have to. It's recommended that you do. Um, as long as you're not, you know, cutting one orchid and going to another and cutting it, with the same tool, you shouldn't have a problem. Um, if you're buying clean, disease-free, healthy orchids, you shouldn't have a problem putting it into your collection. So, you know, there are growers out there that do have problems with weeds in their pots. Um, that's unfortunate. You know, typically when I go to a grower and I see weeds in the orchid pots, I'll bring the plant home. I'll keep it away from everything else. I'll enjoy it while it's in flower. Once it's done flowering, I pull it out, I repot it, I change all the potting material, I wash it off, make sure I get any weed seeds off of it, and I repot it and I put it in my greenhouse. So I made the mistake one time of going to a greenhouse that had weeds in his plants and I started bringing a couple of plants home, didn't repot them at first, all of a sudden I had a bloom of weeds in all my pots. And I didn't have weeds before. So, 
Yeah, you know, if you're going to, and you're going to find some of the really big growers just can't keep the weeds out of the plants. They just have too many plants. They don't have enough staff. They can't weed them like we would normally. Now the Orchiata bark, you know, you can see I've got, I've got mix made up from home. I mix in sponge rock with it. I mix in a little charcoal and I mix in the clay pellet just to make sure that I have really good drainage. I like to water a lot. Obviously with my sprinkler system on an automatic system, I wanna make sure that my stuff drains really well. You don't need to do that as long as you're judicial about watering your plants. When you're doing it, you know, pick the plant up, weigh it, feel how heavy it is, um, and we'll go, you can judge how much you're watering it by that, okay? Possibly. Um, orchids, when you pot them, don't like to be over potted. So if you were taking a plant in a four inch pot and you said, okay, I want to repot this and I don't want to have to repot it for a long time. And you step it up to this, you're going to kill this. It's called over potting. Orchids like to be a little root bound. They like to have confined roots. Um, so Not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. Um, what I would do is, you know, if this had to be repotted, I would go up to the next size up pot. You know, once the plant gets a little bit bigger, you'd go up to the next size up, okay? You wouldn't jump up to the next size. You know, you go just to the right next size, okay? Um, and, you know, never over pot. So if you would like to stay, you're more than welcome. I will be more than happy to teach you about that and we'll go from there.